good morning. Welcome, uh, particularly to those from outside Raleigh, but uh, to everyone who's uh, come downtown on this beautiful, sunny Saturday morning. Um, as you've seen, there are lots of other activities going on down here, including uh, the Tar Heel Junior Historian History Day at the History Museum, uh, which, as I've discussed with, with some folks, has uh, been for years a, a Quite, a, quite an undertaking. Uh, Dolores Hall and some of the rest of us have been judges on that for years and years, but uh, we've opted out now. We've read enough papers about uh, Matthew Brady and, and the Civil War in North Carolina, and it's somebody else's turn. So uh, we're much happier to be here with you all today. At the 2015 Lithics Conference entitled Modeling Prehistoric Behavior Through Lithic Studies, a North Carolina Example. Uh, I'm Steve Claggett. I'm the state archaeologist with the Department of Cultural Resources, if you don't know me. Um, but I'd like to begin. I'm going to make some introductory remarks, but then turn it over to Lee Abbott to introduce the speakers. And we've got a fairly full, uh, but I believe informative agenda. Uh, Lee will also be the timekeeper. So, uh, if you see him waving his arms, which I'll probably see like that, it's time to sit down. But I would begin uh, actually by thanking everyone who's helped put this together, uh, particularly the Museum of Natural Sciences for use of this very nice William Ross Conference Center, which is very impressive, uh, both technologically and light and space and, and everything you could possibly want. Our co-sponsors for the uh, session are, is the USDA National Forest in North Carolina, or as we all know them, the Forest Service, and we, we thank them. Uh, participants, uh, I won't thank you in individually right now, but uh, introductions will be made by Lee Abbott uh, shortly. I'd particularly like to thank my staff who have uh, worked long and hard, first of all, thinking up this, uh, this great interchange, exchange of, of information uh, valuable to North Carolina archaeology and geology and, and others. Uh, Lee Abbott, of course, John Mintz, Sam Franklin, Dolores Hall, Susan Myers, and Lynn Hunsicker, who's uh, uh, most of you don't know, but Lynn works down at our, our lab on Lane Street and has, holds a fort down there on many days. Um, as far as introductory remarks, I can almost do it in one word and just say rocks. Yay. Yay. <laughs> uh, we're not going to talk about pottery. We're not going to talk about bones, nor wood, nor baskets. So uh, as an archaeologist uh, who used to do a lot with rocks, I'm really happy today. Uh, for most of human history and prehistory, rocks have trans transformed into stone tools are the essential puzzle pieces for understanding human behavior, which is why we're here and what we'll talk about today. They, the rocks, the tools made from them are the enduring elements of the so-called Stone Age. Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic, at least in the old world we hear terms like that, which uh, imply primitiveness to many people. So when you talk about Stone Age, it's like it's really old. You know, savages running around, you know, naked or, or barely wearing skin clothing. But uh, you know, stone tools and the so-called Stone Ages, wherever you are on the globe, uh, are really what, hist what our human, common human history or prehistory is, is all about. Not just for thousands of years, and not just for tens of thousands of years, but for millions of years. No stone tools no history, no culture in, in many ways. Lithic studies inform us about the ultimate practical, essential cultural practices of the past. And so today we will talk about some of those elements of our shared common his cultural history. Identification of geological sources by these ancient people, or maybe not so ancient in some cases, the manufacture and maintenance of stone tools, not only how they're 
how the sources are identified, but how the rocks are modified into tools, which meet the basic needs of human cultures, just as important in my mind as water sources, soil, food, and even social interactions. And so lithic studies, looking at all these rocks, again, tell us a lot about human behavior, which is why we're here, including things like settlement patterns and trade networks. So questions that uh, I think will be addressed, maybe not answered today, include how do we perceive, interpret, and understand ancient behaviors relative to lithic technology? And how can we acquire and share our knowledge to better manage the sites and artifacts available to us? So there's the fun part of looking at rocks and stone tools, and then there's the hard part of making sense of it and sharing that and, and using it uh, to uh, advance our sciences on into the future. So with that, Lee hasn't waved at me yet. I'll sit down and let him make the introductions. Thank you. And I want to add my welcome to everybody and thanks for coming out. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, the first paper is entitled An Update on the Geologic Understanding of the Carolina and Other Volcanic Terrains and a Brief Review of Rock Type Variability on the Terrain to a Local Scale. And it's by Philip J. Bradley with the North Carolina Geological Survey. So. I'm a geologist, and it's all about the rocks for us, but we love lithic material because, I guess, it tells a story of a few, of multiple thousands of years, which is, uh, I guess, a, a pin drop in the geologic history, but it also tells us a fabulous history of North Carolina, or parts of it. And so I'm kind of going to give you a little update, very brief update, basically over a half a billion years worth of history and how this has developed just in the last 20 years through a whole bunch of uh, really high-tech geological techniques, um, analytical work, age dates, and then, uh, I guess, tease out that geologic story that's within all these lithic fragments that we, that we love. Um, so, main area, North Carolina, the Carolina Train. Most of you guys are probably familiar with this map. That's our 1985 geologic map of the state of North Carolina, the Carolina terrain and the uh, red dotted outline, and also known as the uh, Carolina Slate Belt, and you'll know I'll specifically be avoiding the Slate Belt terminology, and I'll, I'll, you'll find out why in a little bit. So in the last 20 years, since the 1999 Lithics Conference, there's been a whole lot of work uh, within the Carolina terrain mainly headed up by Jim Hibbert, who was, was one of the speakers back in 1999, um, with multiple graduate students, um, multiple theses, master's level theses, at least one PhD theses, and then several peer-reviewed papers in major geologic journals. And those include um, places up there from number one is the Virgilina area, right at the North Carolina, Virginia area. Number two are areas that the North Carolina Geologic Survey, myself and Heather Hanna, who's going to be the next speaker, and others have been working on doing detailed geologic mapping um, through USGS funded. Um, we got uh, number five is right on top of Morrow Mountain and in Morrow Mountain State Park. Uh, number eight, seven, and six is the Gold Hill Shear Zone area. That's the, that's the geologic contact between the Carolina terrain and the Charlotte terrain, I guess formerly known as Carolina Slate Belt and the Charlotte Belt. So lots of uh, great work. Um, it's reorganized, well, in every single one of those uh, publications never was the term Carolina Slate Belt used. So I'm, I guess I'm pleading with you guys to, to consider <laughs> using Carolina terrain or terrains in, in the future, at least use them both interchangeably, put one in parentheses or something like that. Um, which kind of gives us, uh, our, we're working on uh, a new kind of terrain map of North Carolina. And we're partially, the North Carolina Geologic Survey is partially to blame for the, the, the main maintenance of the belts because it's on our state geologic map. We also have some smaller maps in which 
they have the belt terminology and we haven't come up with a new one, but we're slowly trying to change that. So now everything's all about terrains. It may seem to complicate things a little bit, but it actually makes things a little simpler. The blues, um, you kind of think from Davie County, uh, Mecklenburg, or Gaston, east, uh, eastern portions of Gaston, Lincoln, Catawba, eastern portions of Iredale, all the way up to that whole blue area in the center of uh, Rockingham, Caswell County. Every, all the crystalline rocks, except for the, the big granite bodies, that are in pink and the Triassic Basin um, are all part of an ancient system of volcanic island arcs that were formed hundreds of miles away from ancient North America. And then everything to the west is are, are hunks of rocks always considered or, or formed. Their history is tightly tied to ancient North America. So it really simplifies things when we can group things into terrains and then these areas that have multiple terrains or, or, or separated into the big fragments. A lot of this new information this last 20 years within the Carolina terrain has been wonderfully and simply in, in some portions um, synthesized in a Carolina Geological Society field trip guide in 2013. Um, uh, this was kind of Jim Hibbard's compilation of most of his students work and it very simply and elegantly kind of simplifies the, the kind of the new uh, interpretations of what's going on in the Carolina terrain. And it, it's boiled down into there is an old volcanic island arc and a new volcanic island arc. The old volcanic island arc is called the Heiko Arc. It is more of the northern, northeastern portion of the Carolina Terrain. Let's get you oriented here. It's a little, uh, this is the North Carolina Virginia border. Here's the North Carolina South Carolina border. Here's Tennessee here. So um, this northern part is the old arc, um, about 630 to 615 million years old. And then the old, or the new arc, is this more yellow area all through here, and that uh, um, is about 550 to 530 million years old. So we take something sim seems pretty complicated, we just got an old and a new arc. Um, here, here's the, our whole entire area of, of our old arc, our new arc, and all of the terrains that have been associated with these ancient volcanic island arcs. Geologists have uh, called it Carolinia, so just a play on uh, the Carolina terrain. And it's a huge portion of, of North Carolina, a big part of Virginia, all the way down to South Carolina and Georgia. So when we talk about the, the, the history that I'm going to present with the new interpretation, we're talking about a huge portion of the southeastern U.S. Um, and of the, the uh, base of the East Coast. Um, so let's go back in our way back machine, and we're going to start with our old volcanic island arc, the Heiko arc. Now remember, that's the northern portions of the Carolina terrain, a little bit under Virginia, and down into uh, definitely Durham, a northwest area of Durham, uh, Hillsboro, Chapel Hill, all the way to about Ramsor area, um, and Moore County is also the, the old arc. So about 630 to 615 million years old, we had um, two oceanic plates were meeting. One was a little older and a little colder, so it was less buoyant, and it was uh, uh, subducted under the, the younger, more uh, uh, buoyant uh, crust. A uh, portion of that uh, subducting, uh, the upper plate was melting, sending up huge blobs of magma forming on the ocean floor, uh, and forming a chain of volcanic islands, uh, similar to our, our little cartoon. And of course, these cartoons are really simplified. Um, and this was off the coast of ancient Gondwana. Gondwana is an ancient continent that's actually a conglomeration of parts of the Amazon, uh, parts of Antarctica, um, and I believe maybe India was in there um, also. So we, we step forward our kind of geologic clock. And through plate tectonics, we know that, and through um, some detailed geochemistry, some age dates, um, uh, paleo latitudes. Uh, we know that our Carolina, well, Carolinia, was in very close proximity to um, the Gondwanan continent. They don't quite know if it was right on abducted onto the onto it, or if it was next to it. But we know there's a geochemical signature that says there's some continental influence. So uh, there, our, our old volcanic island arc um, was was 
was sitting uh, many millions of years until a rejuvenation of volcanism that's about 550 million years old uh, ago. So new volcanoes, new uh, blobs of magma came up through, new, new, uh, uh, new volcanic centers. And I'm gonna now, we're gonna now zoom in to just a, a little area into like one volcanic center um, within our volcanic island arc. And we're gonna go to a place that's uh, probably near and dear to you guys' hearts. Uh, basically the area of Morrow Mountain State Park. We got a little cartoon here of maybe what Morrow Mountain area looked like during the active volcanism about 550 million years ago. Well, we were probably in a shallow ocean, um, could have been hundreds of feet deep um, or just a few feet deep, and we started getting uh, felsic magmatisms. Basically, uh, that's what the rhyolite rhyodacite is. So hot magma was intruding through um, uh, already existing sediments, the, like the SID formation out there, the mudstones and the siltstones. And, when, and as we go forward on our clock, so the, the orange stuff is the hot magma in, whoa, intruding through. So it's oozing up into the, uh, through the sediments onto the uh, ocean floor, building up over time. Maybe there's some eruptions that are spitting out tufts, uh, as well as these, uh, uh, lava. So as soon as this magma breaks the surface, either onto the um, ocean floor or onto uh, above the water, it's now a lava. And it perhaps could have uh, built above the water line. We got uh, ash clouds or small volcanic islands. And then this magma would have chilled and, and cooled, uh, basically solidified. And as soon as you build something up topographically, nature likes to start to weather it down. So we start getting the erosion of this volcanic pile and you get uh, on the flanks, you see you got siltstones and mudstone deposited. So uh, during and very soon after the end of volcanism, you get the erosion of that area and things start to erode down. And then we get piles of sediment on, on the sides of it. And we just get even more piles and more piles. And this is a, during volcanic events, they can be very short-lived, just uh, almost instantaneously to a few thousand years to several millions of years. But we're still, all of this is going on in this probably a relatively narrow 10 million year framework. So we're getting just piles and piles of, uh, we're burying the volcanics of the Morrow Mountain area. Um, a little while later, after the active volcanism of the Morrow Mountain area, uh, the the volcanic island arc portion starts to move away, rift away from Gondwana. Uh, that's the deposition of, of like the Yadkin formation, some of the really deeper water uh, sediments now exposed out in the Carolina terrain. And so our volcanic island arc, our, our, our portion of Gondwana is breaking away, slowly moving away. So it's snapped away and now it's moving through plate tectonics across the ancient ocean. And about 450 million years ago, our volcanic island arc, that includes the old arc, the new arc, the Morrow Mountain um, volcanics, is on its way to collide with uh, ancient North American, starts its collision. And we, we get a big, uh, big uh, train wreck, basically. And so what's going on? How does this affect our Morrow Mountain area? Well, our, our material is deeply buried now and it, it goes along for the ride. So it's being folded. The, uh, the uh, sediments and volcanics within the new volcanic art are folded in these really mile wide, multiple mile wide folds. The Denton Anticline, the New London Syncline. That, on the state geologic map, they make those big S-shaped loops. And Morrow Mountain sits on the limb of one of those big folds. So it's slowly, it's tilting basically. Um, our deformation stops. This is when we have the metamorphism is occurring. So all of these sedimentary rocks and volcanic rocks are now meta sediments, meta rhyodacite, meta siltstone, argillite. And um, uh, we step forward. Here comes uh, ancient African continent on the heels of uh, our volcanic island arc. We kind of we're, we're finished with the collision of our of our volcanic island arc. And then we're going to get the big culmination of our mountain building event, the, the Allegheny and Orogeny, in which ancient Africa slams into North America. We get the formation of our thousand mile long um, uh, Appalachian Mountains. And an interesting 
facet of the Carolina terrain is that during that deformation, the, the 300 million year old um, Allegheny orogeny, it's not metamorphosed again. It basically just goes for a ride, basically as part of these multiple uh, thick thrust sheets as, as Africa's slamming in ancient North America. It's pushing just piles and piles of material to the west. And only material that was really deep gets metamorphosed. Um, all good things that come together come apart. And so when we had the culmination of our uh, continents coming together, we formed the supercontinent Pangaea. About 240 million years ago, Pangaea starts to split apart. And here's the little red uh, area is uh, kind of a rudimentary North Carolina sitting right in the middle or near the middle of our ancient Appalachian Mountains. Uh, we step forward our clock, we're opening up the Atlantic Ocean. And as that's occurring, we're forming an ocean, we're starting to form our, tr our, um, our coastal plain. So billions and billions of tons of material are eroding from what's now the Piedmont, forming our coastal plain. So miles and miles of material is being eroded on top, from on top of Morrow Mountain. So we're getting the slow eating away of all this material. Um, and we finally come to basically the, the present day where because of rock hardness, the rhyodacites are really hard compared to the uh, pretty easily to weather SID formation, the argillites, the metamudstones, metasil stones. We have a really nice topographic high. Um, and a really important thing of this is if you walk across the state park, you go from the metasediments, you go to the, the rhyolite, the rhyodacite, and the, ry the rhyodacite, the Morrow Mountain rhyodacite, has varying textures. You got the stuff that's beautiful for making lithium material, but there's also stuff that is still part of that same lava intrusion, but looks totally different. But uh, um, still has contrasting textures. And you walk to the other side of Morrow Mountain, you're back into the meta sediments. There are some mafic rocks all throughout there. So you get this very heterogeneous um, batch of material that because this was a volcanic terrain, which is pretty chaotic uh, naturally, you get something that almost looks chaotic um, in, in our present day. So at Morrow Mountain, there's you get the outline of Morrow Mountain. The, the oranges are the rhyodacite peaks. Uh, the Lowlands are most of the are most of our meta sediments. Uh, where the, the main mountains are our rhyodacite, and of course in the peaks you got the the rhyodacite, and the lowlands you got the um, meta sediments. And so that's kind of a snapshot geologic process, well the geologic history of how we get the seemingly contrasting rock types across an area for the new arc. Let's kind of jump, I'm going to jump around now. We're kind of done with our geologic history that I'm going to present. Talk a little bit more about variation of rock types at a site or in an area. Um, this is kind of an example of maybe the, the Hillsborough, Northwest Durham area, Chatham County area. Still was a volcanic terrain, um, part of a volcanic island arc. The same exact geologic processes occur. You got uh, volcanic center builds up and erodes. So uh, we're kind of zooming in on a, a little part of a, just one part of a volcanic island that we have a cross section of it up there. We're just looking at one little peak with a myriad of different volcanic rocks. The oranges is going to be a rock type very similar to the Morrow Mountain Rhyodacite. It's a, it's a day site. We call it a day site here in the, the old arc. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to, we're going to start a period of active volcanism. We're going to Volcanism ends, it starts to erode. Sediment is deposited off the flanks of the volcano. The, the high, volcanic highlands are eroded down and we get uh, sediment on the side. And we haven't even deformed this or tilted it and eroded it and we still get that uh, contrasting rock types um, throughout an area because of the chaotic nature of how they were deposited. So then yeah, you, you tilt this and you deform it you metamorphose it, and you get even more uh, hard to interpret or, or uh, difficult to understand areas. Um, talk a little bit about in just a few remaining minutes of some resources that uh, are at your fingertips on the web. The USGS has a wonderful database called the National Geologic Map Database. You can type in authors, locations, and get uh, 
uh, lots of good resources. One of the resources you can download from there is the uh, Stromquist map from uh, kind of the central portion of the Carolina terrain, which includes the Morrow Mountain area. A little red box has a blow up of the Morrow Mountain area. And the, sent the blue is uh, the, the rhyodacites, the rhyolites. Actually, they call it felsites, I believe, here. You see these, the beautiful curving nature of the, of the sediments. That's the, the uh, flat swamp member of the Sid formation, which is uh, really good hard material of rhyodacites. And all of that, that folding, that big S shapes occurred uh, from the collision about 450 million years ago when that, the Gold Hill shear zone was moving at the same time. And all our foliations and the uh, these folds are attributed to that. And another real important thing to realize is that geologic maps, the units map packages of rocks generally. It's not just one rock type and it's not going to be a consistent rock. Very rarely is it a consistent rock type. Um, so any of like the gray area, it's mainly meta sedimentary rocks, but there's sandstones, siltstones, the occasional tuff is in there and that tuff sometimes can be have very wonderful vitric-like characteristics that could be wonderful for um, lithic material, but then right next to it could be these meta siltstones that uh, are, are, un are not prefer preferentially used. Another resource is the North Carolina Geologic Survey's uh, website. Uh, we have our, in our publications area, under our open file reports, we have a whole bunch of our new mapping within Orange and Chatham County available for download. We also have them available as, they're called geo PDFs, which we export a geo reference map from ArcGIS that you can pull up on your iPhone or iPad or your Android device and know what geologic unit you are on in real time using your GPS. So it can be very useful. We don't have all of our maps like that, but uh, someday we'll hopefully get that way. Uh, if you like the paper map in your hand, um, you can order it as a print on demand. So lots of good resources from our online store. And lastly, the Carolina Geological Society. Um, it's a, mainly a North Carolina and South Carolina um, uh, professional organization that leads field trips every year throughout the Carolinas. 2013, uh, the, the, the Jim Hibbard hosted the trip in, to the traditional central uh, Carolina Terrain, great resource, the guidebook from there. You can download many guidebooks off this website. You can't download the 2013 yet, but I have the link uh, up here and can provide that to you. So I think I am done. And I gave you half a billion years of geologic history in 20 minutes. <laughs>